today on Revelation to Transformation with Pastor Paul White. Anger is not a sin. What you do with it can lead to some dangerous consequences. Watch how Jesus handles his anger. Jesus is angry, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. So he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out immediately, plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Well, let's don't throw a party and get excited that the man can now use both hands. Let's go make sure that we can arrest Jesus. Now, what is the purpose of these two stories being back to back? Well, the What is meant by the term salvation? And what are some ways to effectively share your faith with others? Pastor Paul White was recently asked to submit six 30-minute sermons aimed at an audience of unbelievers in order to introduce them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. These sermons are currently airing on an international Christian satellite network with a potential audience of over one billion people. Now you can own these six sermons on DVD as study tools for effective evangelism or share them with friends and loved ones who need to hear the good news about God's love and Christ's sacrifice. This six DVD set can be yours for only $30 plus $5 shipping and handling. Contact us today at 1-877-244-3353 or order online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. Five is widely regarded as the Hebrew number that represents God's grace. It is no coincidence that there are exactly five women named in Matthew's genealogy of Jesus found in the first book of the New Testament. Each of these five women represent God's grace and favor in various ways and at different times in our own lives. Pastor Paul White delivers five sermons in this series covering the stories of Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. This series is available to you for only $20 plus shipping and handling. Contact us today at 1-877-244-3353 or visit us online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. It's all backwards. So you don't touch a shadow, yet you could touch the Old Testament shadow. The shadow was the tabernacle, the shoe bread, the sacrifice. You could put your hands on all that. Yet they were all shadows. The substance is in the new covenant, and you can't touch any of it. You can't touch the anointing. You can't walk up and touch Jesus. So here's my, this is worth a whole sermon. And I told you last week we were going to keep going through Hebrews, but I just didn't get the clearance of the Lord to, to do an hour on it. Sorry. I, I, but I got to get a little bit out of my system. If you know me. The, the stuff you touch, watch out for. I didn't say it's all wrong, but watch it through the lens of the Spirit. Because you are spirit beings living in a natural world. So that what we have under the new covenant, we have on the basis not of sight, but of faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. That doesn't mean stuff doesn't manifest in the real world, in the, in the natural world. That doesn't mean that at all. I don't, we, I don't want to put it all in one box. But generally speaking, the new covenant is a touchless covenant. Tasteless, sightless, smellless. But the old covenant was all the stuff. You can put your hands all over everything. And that's why Hebrews said, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched. Sinai could be touched. Zion cannot be touched. Old covenant can be touched. New covenant cannot be touched. Old covenant, substance abounds. But it was all shadow. New covenant, we're in the substance, but it all looks like shadow. Hope you're not thoroughly confused. So I just want you to see that because that's a general way of understanding the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Now, I take one of those shadow moments from the Old Testament tonight, and perhaps this is why the Lord led us through where He did last week, and He knew where He would want us this week, and we had no idea. But we take one of those shadow moments, which is Sabbath. And my title says Sabbath Significance. We take a shadow moment like the Sabbath, and we put the significance of a New Covenant on it. What does it mean to us? So it's a big battle because the Sabbath day in Christian terms means, well, traditionally it means. I don't know that, I'm, I don't agree with it. I'm just going to tell you what it traditionally means. Traditionally, Christians say the Sabbath is Sunday. It's the Lord's day because it celebrates resurrection and uh, that it's a day set aside that you ought to rest. And so we've had in our own country blue laws and 
um, all kinds of things in effect to keep the Sabbath day holier than the other six days. So you can't buy beer, or you at times couldn't go out to eat, or you, you know, there's all kinds of different, and then there's still some places where there's certain things you can and cannot do because it's Sunday. Um, and we would say that's to, that's to keep one day sacred and consecrated, while the other days you can, you know, whatever. Um, I wasn't raised in a strict Sabbath-keeping mode to the level of we don't do this, 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 this on Sunday. Although there was some things that you didn't do because they were too much like Saturday. And I'm not, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm just telling you the, the, the world in which I grew up in. You didn't mow your yard on a Sunday afternoon. You should have done that on Saturday. You didn't do it on Saturday. You just got to do it Monday because you sure didn't do it on Sunday. It was, it was too much work. There was a difference in... Apparently, it was okay to wait tables because we love to go out and eat on Sunday. It was okay that they had to cook, but, you know. So, we were, we've always been in, in America, and i got an international audience, but the American version of this has always had, it's been a little bit regional in the Christian idea of Sabbath. Now, I, I don't even agree with any of that, and I'll tell you why, because um, I'll tell you the Jewish idea of Sabbath, and you can compare the two, and then we'll see where we line up. The Jews had Sabbath on the seventh day. And the reason that they did that is based upon Genesis 2, where God creates the heavens and the earth, and he spends six days doing that. And then on the end of the sixth day, after he has created man and called him very good, the Bible says he comes to the seventh day, and God rests from his labors at the end of the sixth day. And on that seventh day, God does nothing and just rests. Now, I don't believe that there was a moment where God just propped his feet up and did nothing, but I do believe that that scripture is telling us something, that God designated a time, this is pre-law, there's no law come along yet, but he designated a time in which he observed a Sabbath, which is the word rest. And so that Sabbath become a part of man's lifestyle. Now to a Jew, it's still sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night that's the Sabbath day, and so Jews or Orthodox Jews will celebrate Sabbath on that time frame, because it was always sundown to sundown. That's how they observed days and nights, which also can explain something about three days and three nights in the tomb, but that's for another sermon that probably belongs closer to Easter, which, hey, we're like a week away. Um, but for the Christian, Sabbath... Uh, came to mean Lord's Day because the early church would get together on the Lord's Day in observance of Resurrection Sunday. And one could make a strong case that the early church met intentionally on Sunday to separate themselves from Jews. Because Jews met on Saturday, the early church intentionally met on Sunday to observe the resurrection of their Christ. The Jews did not think their Christ had yet come and they still don't. And so the early church observed a different day. Personally, I don't believe that either one of them has to be your Sabbath set in stone, either a Saturday or a Sunday. And I'm also not going to spend the next 45 minutes or an hour trying to tell you to pick one. Because that's what some people do. That's how some people approach it. Well, I don't care what day you pick. Just pick one. If Wednesday's your day off, make that your Sabbath day. Do nothing. Rest. If Saturday's your day off, pick that. That's not where I'm going to go with this either. I want to show you a way that is a substance way, not a shadow way. What, you're want, what a lot of the church is wanting is a shadow way. And remember, shadow ways are stuff you can put your, your hands on. So they want a calendar day. They want you to pick a day of the week where you observe Sabbath and you pick that moment and then you don't do anything else. You just observe it. That's a sub, they, they're taking a shadow day and wanting to put some substance on it. But I want to show you Jesus. That's a great starting and stopping point. You don't get any better than Jesus. Because Jesus is the Son of God. He's actually God in human flesh. He's God personified. He shows you what God was always thinking when, when sometimes we get confused. Mark chapter 2, keeping in mind, by the way, that Sabbath, or Shavath, as the Hebrews would pronounce it, is cease, desist, or rest. Cease and desist. You get a cease and desist letter? You're doing something someone doesn't like? You got a Sabbath letter. If you were speaking in the Hebrew, 
You got a Sabbath, a Shabbat letter. Stop it. That's what it means. Stop it. Cease from your works. God ceased from his works after six days. Had a day of rest. Mark chapter 2. Let's start in verse 23. And we're not going to stop just because the translators decided that the chapter was over. We're going to keep reading because there's back-to-back Sabbath stories that are there for a reason. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Your, your old King James says cornfield, doesn't it? Which is odd because they didn't have corn. But they did have grain fields. Okay. On the Sabbath, and as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Interesting to me that a group of Pharisees are following them through a grain field. Just out to show you that there were some people that really just wanted to try to catch Jesus whenever they could catch him, doing whatever they didn't think he was supposed to be doing. Why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? But he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest, and he ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him. This is a good question. Do, was David a priest? No, he was a king. So by Jewish law, did he have the right to eat the showbread? No, he did not. And he said to them, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. If you miss everything else I'm going to say tonight and you need one verse to walk away with, there's your verse. All right? It's Mark chapter 2, verse 27. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. What came first? The man or the Sabbath? The man. You were created on the sixth day. God rested on the seventh. Notice that God doesn't say the Sabbath was created for God. He says the Sabbath was created for man. Isn't it interesting, though, that the first time we ever see Sabbath, it's God resting. Now, why does God need to take a break? He's God. He doesn't have to. Could God have worked on through the seventh day and been just the same God? I don't doubt it at all. So God doesn't stop because he's wore out. God creates the seventh day for what he just created on the sixth. Once he saw man, he went, he's going to need some time off. I mean, the very next day. So I'm going to give him a break. So why was the Sabbath created? The Sabbath was made for man. It wasn't man for the Sabbath. So God didn't create a Sabbath and then put a man... So that the man could fill his Sabbath. He created a man and then created a Sabbath so that his Sabbath could bless his man. I know it sounds simple, but somehow we miss this a little bit in this whole Sabbath argument. What the simplicity of Jesus is often masked with so much complexity of theology. It's why Paul told the church at Corinth, I'm worried for you that you be removed from the simplicity of Christ. This is a guy that's theologically deeper than all of us. And yet he was scared Corinth would get removed from the simplicity of Christ. 28. Therefore, and when you see a therefore, find out what it's there for. Seeing as, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing 27. Seeing as the Sabbath was made for man and, the, and it wasn't the other way around. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord over the... Now why doesn't he say the Son of Man is Lord over man? Why does he say the Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath? Put two and two together. Let's walk real slow. 27. The Sabbath was made for man. 28. Who's the Sabbath? Jesus. Plug that back into 27. Jesus was made for man and not man for Jesus. Is that Are we in the book? Jesus was made for man and not man for Jesus. And yet, our theology in the church always says you were created for God's pleasure. The reality is, is you were created in relationship, not for relationship. You were created inside of relationship with God. He didn't create you then try to go by you. He created you as His. He was already in you. And then there was a separation. And then He sent Jesus for man. Man is not here for Jesus. Jesus is here for man. One of the hardest concepts for me to get 
old line Christians into new covenant thinking, one of the hardest concepts for me to get them to swallow is, God is in the serving business. And we have a hard time with that because we think God wants us to always serve. And the reality is Jesus told His disciples, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. That's a hard pill to swallow for some of us old religious folk. Because we think God's got us here to do stuff. And the reality is, is God's got us here to love life and see good days. And He wrapped Himself in human flesh so it'd be a little bit easier. That's why He came. Not so you could get to heaven, but so that heaven could get to you. And that doesn't take anything away from His beauty. If anything, to me, it adds to it. It makes God so glorious that He had that in mind when He did all this. So putting those two together, the Sabbath was made for man, or Jesus was made for man, and not man for Jesus. We go to chapter 3. And He entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched Him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Now, why were they watching so they could accuse him? Were they watching to see if there would, this guy would get healed? Couldn't care less if this guy gets healed. In fact, they, the only reason they want the guy to get healed is so they've got a reason to accuse Jesus of breaking the law. This is religion at its best. Religion at its best Please, for, please forgive me with this boldness, but I, I, it's the only way I know how to say it and really get, get through my thick skull, all right? This is how I teach myself to teach or preach. Religion needs you to fail, okay? Because if you stop failing, you don't need religion. <laughs> Do you know how dangerous your success is? Do you know how dangerous your success is to the modern ministry? Do you know how dangerous your prosperity is to the modern ministry? Do you know how dangerous your prosperity is to the modern 501c3 corp not-for-profit church on the street corner? You know, if, because if you're prosperous and you're successful and you're victorious and you're happy and you're loving life and seeing good days and you're not a codependent, and you don't have to have a tree of cell phone buddies to get you through every weekend, then you are dangerous to our existence. Now you can feel my sarcasm. If you can't, stay on board. Because I can find some more. But the, the truth of it is, is that religion is always standing there watching closely to see not whether or not people will get victory, but whether or not people mess up. That is it. Well, we saw what you did, and that's not right, and here's how we're going to fix it. This, ama- this story blows my mind that people could stand in the same room with the Son of God, God robed in human flesh, and rather than be excited about, what are we going to see next? This is incredible. Bring every sick person you can find in. This is amazing. Rather than that happening, they go, I w- you watch, because if he heals this guy, we're going to bust him. Isn't this amazing? This is unbelievable to me. Jesus, we think we got it rough once in a while with some persecution. Jesus walked through this mess all the time. He couldn't even do good for people thinking it was bad. Because it's bad to set people free. Why? Because you didn't do it on the right calendar day. And he said to them, who had to, I love it that Jesus doesn't even worry about it. Man, man, he's, he's the man. He said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. And then he said to them, oh, I love this. Because he turns to his accusers. He's already got the guy to come forward. He's going to be here. He says, Step, come up here. Now, I think he, comes, he has him come up here so he can hear the whole conversation. So when he, when he walks forward, he says to the Pharisees, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they kept silent. Of course they kept silent, because they're talking to the author of the Torah. They're talking to the guy that wrote the thing. And they don't really know what to answer, because Jesus has penned them before. They've had some very unsuccessful debates with Jesus. Things have not really always ended up in their favor. I mean, they catch people committing adultery, and they show up with the rock. And Jesus gets out of it. That's amazing how... How, how, the, how this continues to happen. They keep silent. 
when he looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. If I could throw in a free tip, anger is not a sin. Being angry is not a sin. Now what you do with it is your call. Don't ever say somebody else made me angry. That gives somebody else the power over your emotional response. Nobody makes you anything. That guy made me so mad. No. That guy did something and you got mad. It was yours. Whatever you did with it is yours. If you flew off the handle and cut somebody's head off, that's nobody's fault but yours. If you punched somebody in the mouth, it was you that did it. Yeah, but they made me do it. No, they didn't make you do it. Own your emotions and don't live in guilt over them. Let the Holy Spirit know what's going on all the time. You're not going to hide anything from Him anyway. If anger was a sin, Jesus just sinned. Anger is not a sin. What you do with it can lead to some dangerous consequences. Watch how Jesus handles His anger. Jesus is angry being grieved by the hardness of their hearts. So He said to the man, stretch out your hand. And He stretched it out and His hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out immediately, plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Well, let's don't throw a party and get excited that the man can now use both hands. Let's go make sure that we can arrest Jesus. Now, what is the purpose of these two stories being back to back? Well, the first story has Jesus and his disciples walking through a grain field, and they're hungry. And so the disciples pop heads of grain off, start to eat right in the middle of the field. And the Pharisees say, you're not supposed to do that because it's the Sabbath day, and you can't pick grain on the Sabbath because that's work. And Jesus quotes a story from the book of Samuel where David is on the run and he doesn't have anything to eat. So he runs towards God. He goes and takes refuge in the tabernacle. And he does what he's not supposed to do in that he runs into the front door of the tabernacle and he grabs the shoe bread off of the, gold, the golden table which is reserved only for the priest to eat. And David eats it and he hands it out to his men who are starving to death. And Jesus asked the Pharisees, was David a priest? And they go, no. Well, then David wasn't supposed to eat that bread. Now, that, that brings up an important question. Why didn't God kill David when he walked into the tabernacle and he grabbed hold of the bread and he ate the bread and he handed the bread out to all those who were with him? Jesus is trying to teach us something about the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. The letter of the law is what Paul said in Romans, you are now free from due to the death of Christ. Yet you still serve God in spirit. Are we we're still in the book? But Jesus is showing us that God didn't just want to wait until the blood was shed at Calvary to institute that. God had always had that in mind where the spirit of the law could be lived out. And so David, who was hungry, ate it. In Matthew's version, which hopefully we'll get to, but I know I'm already running short on time. In Matthew's version of the same story, Jesus tells this story about David, and then he throws this one in. And the priests, every Sabbath day, do break the law because they go into the tabernacle and they work. The priest worked every time, every Sabbath. They walked in there every week and they worked all day long. See, I work on Sunday when I get up and minister, and if Sunday work is wrong, then I'm wrong every week. And there's a whole lot of other people just like me. And so that's what Jesus was saying. If, if it was wrong for them to do this, then they should never have been allowed to offer up sacrifices on Sabbath day because by doing that, they're breaking the law. Now, was Jesus trying to insinuate that they, that they should have been killed? No, Jesus was trying to insinuate that the spirit of the law was that if no one came in and worked, how in the world was anybody going to have a sacrifice? And so God, Jesus is trying to say, should I... Do good or should I do evil? And notice that doing evil would have been doing nothing. Because he just said, should I do good or should I do evil? Which one? And, and he wasn't, surely wasn't going to, this guy's got a withered hand and this thing doesn't work. Surely by doing evil, Jesus wasn't going to make the other one curl up. Because that's not in his character. So what did Jesus consider evil? Jesus considered it evil to see the man have need and then walk on because it's the wrong day of the calendar week. Because what would that have shown him? That would have shown him that God is way more concerned about the day than the man. So Jesus just made this statement. The man was not made for the day. The day was made for the man. And I'm the Lord of the day. And if I walk in on that day and somebody needs some good, it would be evil for me not to do them good. 
That's Jesus' message of the Sabbath. But is he allowed to do that? That's my, that's my question. I want to show you the spirit of the law. What we're really trying to do here all the time is not, we're never downing the law. And, and, if, and if that's the impression that you get in the message of grace, we've we got a lot more work to do. We never down the law. But I really do believe that we're in good company when people once in a while misread how we feel about the law. I'll tell you what. You, you remember this? this I, I never really saw it this way until today. But do you remember in Matthew? Okay, let me, let me backtrack. In Romans, the Apostle Paul said, it's been slanderously reported that I preach, do evil so that good may come. He uses the word slanderously reported. Now, slanderously reported means some people have been reporting, sending out word that Paul cared. Don't go down there to Paul's meetings because Paul's going to preach that the more bad you do, the more grace God has. And that's dangerous. And Paul called that slander. But he didn't deny that if you sin a bunch, grace will abound. In fact, the more he started talking about it, he gets on a roll. Go read the book of Romans. And the longer he talks about it, he can't hold himself back anymore. And he gets to the end of the fifth chapter and he said, so I thus conclude that where iniquity hath abounded, grace hath hyperabounded. He couldn't stop himself. Well, then he caught himself again. Watch the sixth chapter open up and he goes, so what should we say then? Should we just go ahead and keep sinning so that grace may abound? And you see Paul go back to that theme three times. Three times in the book of Romans alone, he defends the gospel of grace against people who keep saying he's overdoing it. What I hadn't seen, I've seen that before. What I hadn't seen before, I saw today. Paul learned how to do that from Jesus. Remember this? In Matthew 5, Jesus said, Think not that I have come to destroy the law. Throughout the church world, believers long to be victorious over sin, the flesh, and the devil. Christ's death on the cross provided us with all the tools we need to walk in perpetual victory and to experience the abundant life. Pastor Paul White closely examines the armor of God that Ephesians 6 tells us to put on in this seven sermon series titled, The Whole Armor of God. Prepare for a fascinating journey into the believer's warfare with powerful sermons such as as the breastplate of righteousness, wearing the shoes of God's peace, and the sword of the Spirit, God's spoken word. This series can be yours for the price of only $30 plus shipping and handling. Contact us today at 1-877-244-3353 or visit us online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. More information about Paul White Ministries and how you can become one of Paul's partners, visit us online at www.paulwhiteministries.org. That's www.paulwhiteministries.org. Have a blessed day and may God richly bless you.